Here's the hadith. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We're actually on the 35th hadith. This is my son behind me, you guys. 35th hadith. And the hadith goes as follows. An Abi Hurayrata, radiyallahu anhu, qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la tahasadu, wa la tanajashu, wa la tabaghadu, wa la tadabaru, wa la yabi'a. بعضكم على بيع بعض وكونوا عباد الله إخوانا المسلم أخ المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يكذبه ولا يحقره التقوى ها هنا ويشير إلى صدره ثلاث مرات بحسب امرئ من الشر أن يحقر أخاه المسلم كل المسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وعرضه رواه مسلم. So this hadith is actually one of the most important hadith, if not probably the most famous hadith in relating to brotherhood and sisterhood. So what does it look like? I'm going to first translate the hadith, the words of it, you know, just the general words. Uh, the general words, and then we'll go in detail about every single terminology or every single term here. لا تحسدوا, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not envy one another. Do not bid on others' bids. Do not hate one another. Do not turn your backs on others. Do not, uh, do not sell or, what is the word? Yeah, well, do not sell over each other's sales. And be Muslim brothers, servants of Allah Almighty. A Muslim is a brethren to a Muslim. Does not oppress him. Does not, does not uh, betray him. And does not deny him. Not, like the does not, well, lie to him. And does not condescend him. Taqwa is in the heart. And he points to his, um, to his chest three times. It is enough. For, for the evil for anybody to do, that anybody to commit, to belittle his Muslim brother. Every Muslim on another Muslim has a sacred relationship in where their blood, their wealth, and their chastity is all sacred and must not be transgressed. Rawaha Muslim. So this hadith, pretty straightforward, but of course there are some things that we need to actually go in detail about so what does do not envy one another and how does it look like and all these different things and what does it mean to not bid on somebody else's bids and etc. So we're going to continue inshallah. So what does the the word la tahasadu, what does envy mean? Well, there are different types of envies. There is the positive envy and there's the negative envy. So when we're talking about a positive envy, we're looking at a positive envy where the Prophet ﷺ actually explained the positive envy in one of the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually said there's no hasad, there's no envy that is valid or that is permissible except in two types, in, in two to, at two times or in two occasions. The first occasion is that you would wish that you had somebody's knowledge you wish that you had somebody's knowledge but here the positive envy is that you don't wish that that person's knowledge goes away but you wish that you would have their knowledge in other words to use to um to um to make use of in order to spread it about in order to um in order to help uh, teach others, etc., and let others know. So this is the first hasad that is permissible. The second hasad that is permissible is the hasad when you wish that, oh, I wish I had, you know, Bill Gates' money, for example. I don't necessarily wish that Bill Gates loses his money, um, for example, okay? This is not real, um, because, uh, yeah, then, let, let's stay on topic. All right, so you don't wish that X or Y would lose all their money, but you just wish you had their money in order to, in in order to donate or in order to um, invest that money for a good cause for you know changing within the society, etc. So now it's not that you wish that the person would go into some kind of an evil, and this is really important to mention because the word hasad, the word hasad. It more is 
relating to wishing and hoping that somebody would lose the privilege that they have. That privilege could be probably the privilege of marriage or probably the privilege of beauty or probably the privilege of um, prosperity or probably the privilege of health or power or what any type of a privilege that is you know that is given to a person now it's really important to mention that when we speak of different privileges we speak of different privileges Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does actually mention that people at are, are at different levels of privileges but these privileges are not necessarily granted to you because of because you are you happen to be a good person but a lot of these privileges and that's why the a actually says um uh, the a actually says in um uh, uh what it well, let me let me try to remember it. Um, uh, when abluwa kum bishadri wal khairi fitna, that nabluwa um, kum bishad that evil is actually a test, but al khair and good things, in other words, privileges or a fitna, it's a trial. You may take advantage of that that privilege and without you realizing that privilege was not everlasting and which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually said in surah al-hadid likay la ta'saw ala ma fatakum wa la tafrahu bima atakum so the, the evil things that happen in your life likay la ta'saw in order for you you would know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had predestined in other words had the pre-knowledge about everything that was going to happen to you but that is in order for you to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already had already um, had the previous knowledge and the, the the knowledge before the events take place but that's because in other words don't feel the deep sorrow for something that past or some trauma or some drama that might have happened to you in the past that is something that happened in the past and the lost hunt and had previous knowledge about it if you are patient about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the one to reward you for it. And la tafrahu bima atakum. When you get something good, don't take advantage of that good thing because it won't last forever. Learn how to be at that balance and do that management and understand that the evil thing that takes place, it starts out big and it gets keeps on getting smaller and smaller until it becomes forgotten. And the good things that come to you are not those privileges that you necessarily deserved, but something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also testing you with. So here, when we speak about hasad, why should we not commit hasad? So the hasad, the word hasad, um, or literally, it actually means to hope that the good that somebody is in they would lose it. In other words, the privilege that they have could be wealth, could be health, could be um, uh, could be anything, could be children, could be anything. That the privilege that they would have, you would hope that they would lose it. Or probably they would go on an evil end. If they've got good health, you would ha hope that they would... Uh, they would um uh that they would get sick or if they had the money you would wish that they go into some calamity and lose all their wealth this is the envy that the prophet ﷺ had actually talked about that is not permissible now there are different types of there are different types of hasad there's the hasad that that not necessarily you wish that the person would lose the privilege that they're in but you would wish that you also had something like it so you see a sister that probably has, you know, uh, many degrees or a good health or she's extremely beautiful and you would wish that I wish I was as beautiful or I wish I had that privilege that 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 she has, etc. Now, that's in that situation. Um, generally, if the person did not wish that the other person would lose that privilege, it's not haram. This is part of our nature that we would wish that we had the privilege that others 
that others had already um, or that others have. This is part of our human nature, although here's one thing, is that it's part of our human nature, but keep in mind how to stay within the boundary of satisfaction. You might see, unless it's a unless it's a privilege of things like dean, of things like knowledge, of things like probably that they're spending it for the good cause, etc. That's actually a good thing to wish that I wish I had that privilege in order to spend it for a good cause. All right. But the negative privilege is when you actually hope for things in dunya. So that is another another level. So what does that mean? What's the difference? When you're actually doing the hasad for the deen cause, you wish that you had the knowledge, etc. That's a positive. That's a positive hasad. But if you actually have the dunya hasad, it's part of our nature to have that that wish that you know or that hope or that desire to have the privilege that others have that's part of our own nature but it's not the best it's not the ideal level to actually hope for the privilege of dunya that they have because that oftentimes without you realizing it can carry within your heart a lot of traces of one agony or may sometimes take you away from justice in which was why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says um, actually says in in the ayah that that don't let your the word is shana'an and shana'an is more of a tension in a heart an agony in the heart and agony and tension and those hard feelings actually come and stem from the feelings of envy. So envy upon dunya matters comes, yes, although it is part of our nature, but without us realizing that actually comes with a different package where that may creep inside your heart and affect your behavior without you realizing. And that's why, you know, doing the jihad of the nafs where you take away that that um that envy that relates to dunya is actually part of part of a, a believer. Well they how do I actually do that tazkiya? How do I do that heart purification to get my mind off and instead of looking at the privilege and looking at the privileges that I have? In where here's an example. Il um uh Ummu Salama um, Ummu Salama actually, oh, I'm not sure why these people actually don't know that. It, that it. Um, when we look at Ummu Salama, for example, and she had wished that she was getting the privilege that other men are getting. She wished, in other words, she would get a, the privilege that other men are getting from jihad, from going to... Um, uh, from going to different, um, like different salawat or etc., all these different things. But then she didn't realize that the privilege that she was getting as a woman is already there. So the A actually was revealed. Do not wish, do not hope for the privileges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given some over another. Don't hope for that privilege. And which is ikhwana. And which is why you want to be those of those brethren. Now, if you look at these these words in this hadith where it's taking you word by word in how to do that that uh, that therapy, that spiritual therapy on the inside. Now the other part is when we're looking at when when we're looking at hasad, we're remembering that there is the most dangerous type of hasad in where the person would wish evil to happen on that person. That's the worst kind of hasad, and it is in fact something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had actually um, had actually asked us to seek refuge in him from the evils of that hasad from the evils of that hasad because of what it might actually cause within the society on an individual level and of course on a spiritual level which is when we read 
ومن شر غاسق اذا و... Now when we go ومن شر حاسد اذا حسد من شر حاسد اذا حسد the evils the evils of envy now it's really important to remember so what really makes an envy so if i would envy a person is it possible that me just i wish i had that person's hair for example and then that sister all of a sudden goes into some kind of an illness loses her hair day or two and everything's gone or you know she would she would say that she's so happy with her husband etc the, the second day you know it all of a sudden her husband um she and her husband are in extreme fights and are probably on the on the threshold of probably getting a divorce all of a sudden just things just go in another end or those goes on so what is it possible that that hasad can have certain effects on ground the all scholars have agreed that yes it can now how does it affect that's something that is part of ghaib something part of the unseen we don't really know how it affects there are some scholars that said that there's something that is produced and produced in the eye or etc some kind of a uh some kind of a fire like um uh energy that affects the 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 other the other thing or the whatever is in front of them that it was envied and but there's really no evidence to prove that really yes even though ibn al qayyim said it and you have a number of scholars that said that um even including ibn taymiyyah that said that there's some kind of a, a that there's some kind of i don't want to use the negative energy which is really um which is really what what a lot of the buddhist and and all those different people actually use but um it is very similar to that meaning um it's very similar in, to that meaning where they said that uh, something it's like they called it uh, sumia they called it like a poisonous a poisonous energy that that um, that exits the from the person that did the that did the hasad regardless of that having any evidence or not at the end of the day is that hasad is real envy is real can it affect a person can it get a person can it get a person sick can it get a person um for probably going some calamities the answer is yes so what do we do in situations like that hasad is real we have to say uh we have to do one we have to do ruqya and ruqya is simply when you put your hands you know as if you're going to wash your face and you're going to put them together and you're going to read qul huwa allahu ahad three times which is surah al-ikhlas three times which is which are the last three surahs in the quran you're going to read qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq three times and you're going to read qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas three times while your hands are folding like you're going to be washing your face you're going to read them with your mouth close to your 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 palms that are open and then you're going to blow three times and then you're going to wipe over your body scholars had different opinions on whether you should blow low with some with some saliva or not i'm just mentioning that um i believe that it's actually just blow three times the blessings of that recitation that you did and you can wipe over your body um and that is actually mentioned in the hadith there's also to say masha allah also um also protects from hasad there is another thing which um scholars and it is actually mentioned in sahih al bukhari where part of what removes hasad is that let's say the person let's say x all right um envied y and this actually happened during the time of the prophet so let me say the hadith so x envied y and it was y that was he was taking a, a shower but of course you know half the half the body was covered so don't think that he was naked out in the street okay so he was covering um the the bottom part was covered but the upper part was not covered and x had seen his body and i guess he loved and envied his physique and x envied y y gets extremely sick why gets extremely sick and why ends up really in bed so the prophet sallam said who envied who envied the sahabi and then they say well it is x and then they ask the prophet sallam said order him to wash 
wash, which is, in other words, to do wudu and pour it on Y. Let's do it again. So let X make wudu and pour it on Y. Now, different opinions between scholars on how that wudu is poured. Now, the wudu that we're talking about does not include the private part, but it's actually talking about the simple wudu where you're washing your face, you're washing your hands, you're, you're wiping your head, you're washing your feet. And you're gathering that water that they had already made wadu with, um, that used water, and then you're pouring it. You're, then you're pouring it over that person. Now scholars have different opinions on whether it is poured on the person's head or whether it is poured on the person's shoulders or whether it is poured on the person's on the person's waist. Um, El Mezri, which is one Maliki scholar, he actually said it's poured on the waist. So this is actually a hadith that was mentioned in Sahih al Bukhari. So just to mention it. Now, so how is that even possible? How can the wadu water actually do anything isn't that disgusting well here's the thing is that we don't even know what hasad is in other words how is it that something is separated from somebody and the person is not connected in other words we know in physics what affects what affects motion what affects power we've got energy this enforced energy affects you know based on the amount of power that you put in it and then with the force and etc we know newton's theories and all these different things but how is it with hasad that is possible how is it possible when it's not the force is not really there so one thing is that when we talk about hasad hasad in itself is ghaib Hasad in itself is part of the unseen. So let's not use the physics, the materialistic physics of what we know about the world actually um, dictate how we understand everything about the world. There is a lot more in this world than the materialistic side of it, but there's actually a lot of the unseen, a lot of things that we don't understand, whether it was good, whether it was evil, or whatever it is. And Hasad happens to be part of that. Just as we don't really understand what death means, what happens to the person after they die, or we don't see the angels, or we don't see shayateen, all those different things we are are told in the Quran that they have some kind of a power, some kind of an energy that affects us in where they'll do wiswas, they'll do um, they'll do some kind of a harm in in pushing us to do evil, to do good, or they're the malaika that tell us to do good, etc. So all these different things are actually unseen and unfelt. So we cannot use the materialistic understanding of what we know about the world and actually think that that's what dictates the world. So again, we can't necessarily think that everything in the world is just about matter in motion. There are certain things that are not matter that still have their influence and have their effect on us. And that is exactly like hasad. So when we talk about, well, in order to understand hasad, or sorry, to understand how X and Y and all that, how it how it has any type of a cure, how it has any power to, re, to remove hasad, we first have to understand that we don't really know much about hasad. So just like hasad is part of ghaib, so is the healing or the ailment from how to uplift and how to remove hasad. So all this is really part of ghaib. Same thing when it comes to magic. Same thing when it comes to magic. My understanding of magic Many people will think, well, it's just about, you know, here you see it, now you don't. And simple tricks where they would hide something in their, you know, funny hat. And it's a rabbit. And then they'll show you how they are actually hiding whatever rabbit in his uh, sleeve or whatever it is. This is not the sihr that was actually mentioned. Same thing when we're talking about the sihr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions min sharrin nafathati fil uqad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in surah al in surah al how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evils of the women that blow in 
in those knots in order to make magic, which is black magic. How does it affect? Does it really have any influence, etc.? Now, we do have a hadith that is actually in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ himself actually faced uh, black magic and the Prophet ﷺ, and again, this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. So somebody might say, well, it doesn't make sense and how does it even, how does it even harm a person when it doesn't even touch it and, and etc.? Well, this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari and in fact, it does have a lot of different narrations that support it. So even if you wanted to accuse that that hadith is somehow not supporting or you think that that hadith somehow um, may be from the Ahad, which is not, but you, or from Al-Mu'allaqat that are in Sahih al-Bukhari, which are some of the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari are considered that with broken chain of narrations. But let's assume that it is. You've got a lot of different chains of narrations that are actually complete, not to mention when we're talking about uh, the, the broken chains uh, or the broken chained ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, not to mention that you've got Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in his book Taghliq al-Ta'liq in where he um, brought up or not brought up, it doesn't mean he brought up in where he fabricated, but he actually got many other hadith with complete chain, chains of narrations to actually complete those broken chains of narrations. Now, having that being said, when we're talking about hasad or, or sihr or magic, those are things that are in the unseen. Those are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the world that surrounds us, that it's actually Actually, more than the materialistic things that you would judge are the only things that are affecting you. Just as when we speak about sorrow, we're talking about depression, you don't really understand how that is affecting the person. It's not like you've got some kind of a blood test that's going to come out and tell you how much or what level you're at in terms of depression. It's actually all pretty much feelings that you are feeling and it's really not seen even though we can take a blood test and actually see yes we can see some things in image in images and in, in in images where they do all these different MRI and brain scans and etc. in order to see what, you know, autism or what depression looks like, etc. And, you know, they can see some things. But at the end of the day is that we're just seeing how it's resulting, but we don't really know how that energy is is happening. We don't really know all those details. Same thing when we're looking at sihr. How does it affect? What energy is put in it? How does it bring about these these um, harmful things in our lives? We don't really know. So let's just keep it at at the place where we don't really know how hasad takes place or how sihr takes place. All these different details, this is really this is really within the ghaib, within the world of the unseen. So, la tahasadu. Why and what are the different levels of hasad? So, there are different levels of hasad. The first one is, well, the first, most important, well, the first one is to actually leave. So, the first level, we've got four different levels. The first level is that you are not envying anybody you're satisfied with what you have you are satisfied that other people may have privileges and that they were granted those privileges it doesn't necessarily make them better but they're also being tested with these privileges you're satisfied with what you have and you're not necessarily going to envy somebody's privileges now this is level one too utopian you might say because it's really part of our nature to wish the privileges that other people may have. So how do I keep away from that? Well, you would work on it. You would work on it by always focusing on the privileges and connecting yourself with the privileges that are really granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you connect yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that grants privileges. So don't overlook other people's privileges or even wish that they would go away. The second type of hasad or the second type of dealing with hasad is that you wish that you 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 had other people's privileges but you're really working hard this is the second level you're working really hard to not envy 
somebody else's privileges, but it's still there. You still wish, not necessarily that their privilege would go away, but you would still, I wish I had that privilege. Oh, I wish I I could also get this type of car, this type of money. And this, by the way, you guys, type of money and type of car is the last thing I would envy. <laughs> no, this is real. Um, uh, I don't know. To me, I don't understand why somebody would envy a car or envy somebody's car. Um, it just it says beep beep and it goes. Um, anyhow, but people have different uh, different hopes in life, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, removing that envy is part of that Iman. But the person may still have it. That's a second level, which is trying to work on doing that jihad of the nafs. So what is the jihad of the nafs? The jihad of the nafs, I'll write it right here. The jihad of the nafs is really when you are pressuring, you are struggling with those inner struggles. You're trying to keep them away. You're not always successful in doing it, but you're still putting in that effort. You're putting in that that energy to get yourself busy with other things probably to get yourself um get yourself away from that environment that's causing that envy to go stronger in you so you try to stay away from probably that person because you know that that envy just goes onto the surface and then you go back home after seeing their car i'm just going to use the car as an example after seeing their car and you're like oh i wish i had it and the whole day you're probably you know googling at how much it would cost and then there you are you're probably adding those numbers and see um how much do i have to save in order to get a car by 2021 to get a car like that or you're probably getting into the way now the third type of envy the term the third type of envy which is the most dangerous one all right that well yeah uh third type of envy is where when you envy the person but then you start wishing that they would not have that privilege. Well, you wouldn't, you would start wishing that they wouldn't have that privilege. On the inside, you just wish that you got the privilege and they didn't get that privilege. That's haram. That is the haram envy. But what the worst, a, a worse envy is when you actually work on taking away the privilege. And this one's really scary because this is where I would say the, the major sins take place, which is the same exact reason why, remember the story of Qabil and Habil when they, when, um, uh, Qabil k killed Habil, and when that happened, it was really because he had envied that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had accepted his sacrifice, and he didn't accept his brothers, and he also gets to marry the prettier girl, and he doesn't get to marry the, the prettier sister. So then that envy started out with an envy, and then later it was it was implemented into committing the crime of killing his own brother. The first crime in the world really started with just hasad. It started with hasad. Now that's when it gets even stronger, when that envy, you would work. And there are different ways of how, how people can envy. Envy one is where you might work Let's say somebody has a job and you really wanted that job. They got the job you didn't, although your CV might be better than their CV, but they happen to get the job. Who knows why? But I guess the people that were hiring, they're just like their charisma. And they, even though you had a better um, experience and a longer experience, but they still got the job and it wasn't you that got the job. So in situations like that, the person may act on that and probably talk to the CEO of the company or probably get something involved in order to get his friend fired. Now that is actually one of the most evil envy uh, that you can actually do in where you're transferring that envy into an evil action. Now, there's so many different things, so many different levels. There's number one in where you're actually doing the worst evil thing, but then there's another level in where people may not realize it. So, for example, I would ask about, I would ask about, let's say, Sheikha X or Y. 
and I would say, yeah, she's um, she's actually good, but and here comes the envy, but she is, um, she has a problem where you know she's not organized. For example, she's not organized, even though you know it's not necessarily even part of the topic and but just wanted to yeah she's good but you know that but was really to find a way to condescend that person because that person might actually envy that person so they will find faults really what motivates that feeling was really hesed she just didn't want to she or he didn't want to admit that they are better that they what they're doing is a great is a great job or whatever it is or they deserve or at least say mashallah or etc but there are different ways where we might envy a person and we would practice it in a way where it would bring hatred in where we don't want that person to be successful so we will we will make it seem like we were objective so we will then use the word but um, she is this. Yeah, she's uh, great, but you know she's um, she's usually boring, or she's usually this, or um, she people uh, always complaining about this and this about her, etc. This is just an example, and this is so common, so common, especially in the groups that are at the same level, probably of education, or probably at the same level of field, or probably at the same level of uh, or their peers or somehow competitors on a on a speci on a certain on a certain um, uh, on a certain field or a program or whatever it is or you know within uh, or co-workers etc so we always want to find ways to disqualify them from you know getting those privileges that they already have and this is part of hasad now there are so many different things of course to say about hasad but it, the most important thing is that we understand that we have to it starts with ha um, acknowledging that we are practicing something that is just our evil side wanting other people's privileges to go down to be lost and we want that privilege to be for ourselves. This is the hasad. And it many times, especially in hasad, especially, like I said, it could be co-workers, could be co-wives, it could be friends, it could be brothers and sisters. That envy actually acts as the that force, um, that force that uh, that is killing that brotherhood and the sisterhood that we are supposed to be having it's killing us on the inside it's it's dividing us as we live our life and not really realize now there are a number of different hadith and different ayat now remember the story of prophet yusuf alayhi salam the story of prophet yusuf where the where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how his brothers were reacting, um, how his brothers, that is Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, how his brothers were reacting um, with him. And the main reason why they were motivated to throw their brother, to, of course, you know, leave him and, um, and somehow keep him away was really that hasad. Again, it's that envy. Uh, they envied their brother, their brother having the privilege, which is being favored by their father, even though he was the youngest and an orphan. His mother had died, but they still considered that that um, that that was not justified, and considered that they had the justification to um, get their brother lost somehow in order to get the favor and be the favored ones from their father. Now, of course, when we're talking about hasad, there are certain things. I'm just going to try to hopefully, you know, go faster, inshallah. There's the hasad, the envy that Iblis had over over Adam. And he said, uh, he said, you know, you created me from fire and you created him from clay. Therefore, I am better. He regarded that I have a privilege. Again, he regarded that he's got a privilege. And then transferred that hasad into considering that well what I will be doing is proving to you that I am better by I will I will 
um, um, harm his children. In other words, I will somehow convince his children to do the wrong thing and to keep you away in order to show you that you should be favoring me over them and that these children of Adam are not in any way preferred over me and that they should not be favored. So therefore, why should I do sujood for them? And that, that I didn't do anything wrong. I was right in and where I should be the one to be favored. And that was the first hasad that was committed. There's also, of course, the hasad that uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had actually mentioned about why the Jews wanted to um, wanted to reject reject the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it was really because they considered that the message was supposed to be sent on one of the children of Israel which is why they were actually living in Medina because they considered that we were supposed to be getting the revelation because throughout history the children of Israel were favored and they were getting the revelations so by by definitely definition we are favored there therefore we should be we should be the ones to get the um, the final message and that's why they rejected the prophet uh, the, the prophet sallam's message um, the other part which is uh, al hasad itself is actually one major division for the Muslim Brotherhood and which is why the Prophet ﷺ actually started out in where he was talking about how does a Muslim relate to the society and the brother, brother, uh, brotherhood around him he started with saying well that it actually starts with an inner feeling that will later on take over so how can it take over so where the Prophet ﷺ actually actually said we're here some examples it can be an, an example of that in where in Na'il in, in Najash what is, what is in Najash the word in Najash is actually bidding when you know when you bid on eBay and stuff that's the bidding okay but the bidding that was considered as haram is the bid, the bid that somebody might do let's just give an example okay so the bid in where x was selling product y okay and let's say z wanted to bid all right so x was selling product y let's say let's call it i don't know phones okay Let's call them phones. X was selling phones and Z was interested in buying. And you had another person that was also um, selling or buying. So what would we do? We've got X, we've got Y, we've got Z and we have H. Okay, so here we go. X was selling phones so he was actually putting them out on the market he was asking for a price but then it was more of an auction so Z says you know I'll buy the phone for from you for three hundred dollars but Z wasn't really interested in buying the phone for three hundred dollars he wanted to put a bid in order to make it harder on H harder on H to buy the phone so H, H will say well I'll buy it for 350 so Z comes really interested in buying he just wanted to get the price higher and the bid higher on H probably because he was favoring X or probably he had some kind of an agony towards H, wanted him to lose money. This is the bid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or um, in Islam that is haram, in where you're just making bids to harm your Muslim brother or sister. And it could be, like I said, that he probably had some kind of a relationship with X or maybe X person maybe x was a stranger but he wanted to make it wanted to make h pay more to lose money so in such situations this is called ittanajush tanajush in where they're actually bidding and the bidding was not for a sake of making a transaction as much as it is for the sake of harming other people harming can be in a form of in a form of transaction and can be in a form of inner feelings at tabahud what is it tabahud it tabahud is really 
different kinds. The tabaghud is bringing in that animosity. A tabaghud is animosity. So when the hadith says, wala tabaghudu, don't have any animosity towards one another. In other, in other words, it's also saying, you gotta love one another. You gotta love one another. And here's the thing, there are different levels of iman. There's a level of iman in where I might feel I might feel that, yes, um, this is a Muslim brother or a Muslim sister. Yeah, okay, um, uh, I'll, I'll just accept it. But there's another feeling in where these Muslim brother or sister, that there's something that we share. Usually, ittabaghud can happen, ittabaghud, which is hating one another, can happen because of maybe a common thing that we share. Maybe a common room that we share. Maybe a common a common home that we share. Maybe a common husband that we share. Um, maybe common parent, sister and brother. There's that animosity in where we feel that we should be favored. So there comes in that tabaghud, in where the hadith actually saying, la tabaghudu, don't hate one another. Why? Because it is absolutely it is absolutely um, a, a, a paradox. It is a complete paradox to a believer. Why would it be a paradox to a believer? Because for a believer, they live to a principle. The, their principle is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But why would tabaghut or tanajus or tahasud be an antagony to a believer? Because all these different things or really to gain a materialistic gain. So when the hadith was actually saying, don't do these things, it's in order to tell you, don't let your heart be hooked on materialistic things. And which is why, in order to train yourself to not be connected to materialistic things, you're living to a larger and a higher principle, the principle of competing to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's content, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased over you, and not the materialistic thing. So how do we actually transform that into a therapy? To transform that into a therapy, you realize that these materialistic things will not last forever. These materialistic gains are worldly gains. It's just a matter of time. And time, even if it's not people, all the different things around us, it's just uh, some laws of physics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the world. And the thermodynamics is enough to let things wear off. Time is enough to let your face and your beauty wear off. But health, it's all about time and everything changes. Your husband, your, your money, your parents, all those that you had thought they were the main gain were really just a materialistic thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you that your com uh, co uh, competition, the competition that you're putting in, in order to gain that materialistic gain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, tame that, put, suppress that down. Don't let that overcome you. Because when that overcomes you, those feelings of hate, those feelings of, of, um, of, um, envy will later on actually transform into a behavior that might bring in, um, might bring in oppression, might bring in harm to others. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you right there, live up to the principle where you want to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's content, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased over you, and therefore you will put all those different those different materialistic things, all those different materialistic things that surround you, you're putting them in a in a the position that they should be in. That they should be in. means and don't. means do not Iktadabur is like turning your back on your Muslim brother. So here, if don't bring hate and animosity towards one another, 
But here's one thing I forgot to mention about Ittabaghud. Ittabaghud is actually in two different kinds. There's a Ittabaghud where I'm loving a person for the sake of Allah, and there's also that I'm hating the person for the sake of Allah. What? How can you love and hate for the sake of Allah? Absolutely. Well, that's because your principle is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when your principle is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're actually avoiding X or Y because they're distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you're just avoiding them. Why? Because again, you're living based on the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not based on the, the principle or the gain of materialism. And which is why the tabaghud, the hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually considered part of Islam. Where you might hate that that action or you might distance yourself from a person because you know that these people are on drugs or these people are doing harmful things or these people are distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you distance yourself away from them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a tabaghud, a that is considered halal. But the, the, the hate that because this person probably has some privilege and you hate them for the privilege that they have, that is considered the haram, the haram tabaghud, and that is considered the tabaghud that will later transform. It will become that behavior that is evil and harming and harming other people. And which is a tabaghud for the sake of dunya. The hate for the sake of dunya. That is the tabaghud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet have actually considered as as not permissible. Now which is why when we speak of that, um, when the, the hadith was actually talking about Muslim brotherhood and and avoiding somebody. So which, you know, when we're avoiding a Muslim brother, so what about the issue of avoiding a Muslim brother or sister for something that they had done? If, remember, that, that a Muslim should not uh, avoid or boycott his Muslim brother or sister for more than three days, well, that is on a condition that it would be for the sake of dunya. So if it's for the sake of dunya, it would be haram to avoid them for more than three days but if it was for the sake of deen for the sake of principle what does that mean let's say that sister she is you know i would say you know going the wrong end let's say this way she's um hanging out with the wrong people she's doing the wrong things in such a in such a situation you if you know that that sister by avoiding her that she is understanding that the path that she is heading to is the wrong path and it's against the dean it's against the principle and you know that it will it will influence her and make her rethink the de the decisions and make her rethink the steps and the environment that she's surrounding herself with, it is allowed to avoid her for more than three days, her or him, for more than three days. But if you knew that, oh, avoiding her might actually let her or make, or might actually make her um, even more engaged within that environment and that she'd be isolating herself from all good people in that way and that way you want to get more involved in probably pulling her or him back then in that situation you shouldn't be so it's more about your your estimation what do you think what do you think that that might actually do in other words how will it affect the person are you do you do you estimate that the person will reconsider what they're doing or do you think based on your estimation that that will um that 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 will just let them think that what they're whatever they're doing is okay so is it going to how how is the effect going to be on them so that's when you would have to do your own estimation and this is your ishtihad and how you deal with that person should i avoid them and avoiding here we're talking about avoiding for the sake of deed so i'm avoiding that sister because she's starting to engage herself with the wrong environment with the wrong groups in or probably doing 
doing something haram. She probably is doing something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had regarded a clear haram. And she probably is um, leaving maybe salah or probably starting to smoke or etc. And then you wanted to use boycott as a way of discipline. All right. If you knew that that will get that probably that person back on track, then you may use that even for more than three days. To avoid them for more than three days, then it would be um, permissible. Um, and here's the question. Is the that same rule of three days avoidance applied for a married couple with kids, adults, and what about for the sake of pride? So when we're talking about avoiding, um, even for the issue of couple, there's actually, it's a for the issue of couple, it's actually a lot more, what is the word that I could say complex than than uh, just avoiding because you know when you're married there are so many different things that come with it so I wouldn't necessarily rush I would say it's a case by case situation and it depends on how it is done um, to avoid um, to avoid the person it takes more than especially if you're if you're married it takes more than just oh I'm just not gonna talk because there's there's a lot more involved with with that you know there's um, uh, especially if you're married there it's a whole different dynamic so I I can't give one answer one answer to that because at the end is that many sisters will misunderstand that uh, that fatwa and actually consider that yeah I can avoid my husband and and then therefore and therefore you know find themselves in bigger trouble so it it actually takes it, it takes a case by case answer in that situation and the sisters they have to use their wisdom to make sure that they're not bringing in more harm and more trouble to themselves than already is all right so the other part in where um in islam of course the wala tadabaru in where you're also not it tadabur is turning your back on that person turning your back and where you're avoiding that person this is it tadabur tabaghud is bringing hate it tadabur is you're avoiding that person to avoid Avoid that person um, again. If it's for the sake of dunya, you're avoiding for the sake of dunya, then that's haram. But if you're avoiding for the sake of akhira, meaning to discipline them, to get them back on track, that's actually permissible if your estimation was that that was going to get them back on the right track. All right. That is more of, you know, the open markets, the open markets in where, let's say you, um, uh, let's say here's X and Y again. All right. So X and Y, um, X and Y, they happen to be both uh, phone companies or, you know, they have to have a phone. Uh, they have a phone shop. X has a phone shop and Y has a phone shop. H comes in and he was actually interested in buying a phone. Y happens to be at that X's shop. All right. So H is looking at the phones and he's like, hey, I like that iPhone X. Or is there an iPhone X? Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I he was interested in iPhone X. And he, how much is it? He was like seven hundred dollars. All right. So X says seven hundred dollars. Now Y, mm, you know, takes advantage of that moment when X went inside his office to grab something, and then Y says he had. Remember, he's got a phone, a phone, um, uh, a phone store right next to Y store. So he just whispers to H and says, "Listen." I'll give it to you for not seven hundred but six fifty. I'm just right next door. All right. This is actually This is that form of a transaction in where you're doing it to harm your Muslim brothers. You wanted to sell a phone and he knew that what or that H was ready to buy that phone and he was just giving him a lower price in order to get him as a customer in his shop that is that's the haram that's the haram transaction in where and there's another hadith where it also had forbid that a person would um, would propose um, over his brother or Muslim brother's proposal. So what does that mean? Here's X and here's Y again. All right. But this time X is actually engaged to H. OK, he's engaged to H. Y heard that H, H girl, got engaged to X. 
And Y thought, well, why don't I just come to H's family and I know that she's engaged to A to X and I will, mm, I guess, come over and, and ask for H's hand. Okay, he's going to H's hand and asking for her hand. And then, of course, he takes the takes advantage. And he already knew that H was engaged to um, X. But he still wanted to propose. That proposal, that proposal is actually haram. And here's the thing. Scholars had differences of opinions on, let us assume that X was engaged to H. Okay, these two were engaged. And then Y comes over and later gets married to H. All right. The scholars had differences of opinions on whether that marriage is valid or not. All right. Whether that ma marriage is valid or not. And Maliki considered that the marriage is invalid. Majority of scholars consider that the marriage is valid, but they are at sin. That why is at sin for proposing to H when he had already known that H was engaged to X already? Now, it's really important to mention here that when we talk about an engagement, we're not talking about a marriage contract here. We're talking about just a proposal where they had given the initial consent that, yes, that that person and that person are going to be preparing for a marriage to take place, maybe a marriage contract to take place in four months or three months, etc. So in that situation, it would be haram to go propose for H and even um, even though he, uh, or when he had known, sorry, let's say it that way, when he had known that, um, that H was already proposed to X. All right, so let's continue here. وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانَ And be... and sisters on that why this was actually emphasizing this hadith kunu ibadallahi ikhwan is emphasizing that your competition should be to please Allah and not and not envy one another or look at each other's privileges on the materialistic side so this is in order to tell us kunu ibadallahi ikhwan let that competition be on who is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala best and then let's put this colon right here al muslim akhul muslim a muslim is a brethren to another muslim this is also true when we say a muslima is also the sister of another muslima what does that look like semicolon la yadlimu they would not oppress one another he does not oppress him what does oppression mean what does it mean to oppress somebody what it means to oppress somebody is basically to now here's things there's al adil and there is al fadl all right, al-adl and al-fadl are two different things because al-adl is justice. So don't act in any injustice towards your Muslim brother. What does that mean to do any injustice towards a Muslim brother or sister? Any injustice can mean to probably cause harm for their life, their nafs, to probably cause, remember, D-N-A-I-M, to cause a harm on probably their education, or probably their mental well-being you're causing you're causing their mental well-being to be at at harm you're probably causing so much drama so much trouble for that person just like in another hadith where the prophet ﷺ actually forbid that a woman would ask her husband to divorce or to divorce his other wife or even if a woman if a man got engaged to another woman she would say well I would only marry you if you would divorce your wife the Prophet ﷺ actually forbid that because it is a form of causing distress and causing some kind of a, an injustice on that family and here and that is the 
chastity part. That's the chastity part to pressure, to pressure in any behavior to bring about injustice. Could be against your brother or sister, or could be against your, your, um, your uh, friends or your probably your, uh, your friends or your, um, uh, you know, uh, co-workers, etc. And this harm is actually a get the opposite of العدل, justice. And which is why the ayah actually says, وَلَا يَجِرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَأَنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَىٰ تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا وَأَقْرَبُوا لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Don't let that animosity within you cause you to act in an injustice, in an in any injustice behavior, and or even uh, in uh, in or even to bring about any agony or any tensions um, or any oppression to the person. So when we talk about oppression, oppressing the person in their life, oppressing them in their mental being, oppressing them in their family and their chastity, or even oppressing them in their wealth. We usually think of oppression only relating to wealth. In Islam, it is more than that. Oppression could also mean in where you're acting in, 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 in any injustice on that person. وَلَا يَخْذُلُ And does not betray him. What is the word, what does betray mean? So to betray somebody means when the, there's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually says, uh, Give the the trust back to those that trusted you. And don't betray those that have betrayed you. Why? Because you as a person, you live based on the principle of doing what is right. Even if other people went low, you don't go that level. You don't go based on their principles, but you live based on the principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not based on the principle of of um, a retaliation, um, not based on the principle of retaliation or based on the principle of hate. Remember, there are different things that motivate us in life. We can be motivated to do the right thing and do um, do the um, th- that that valuable thing, or we can be motivated by our anger, or we can be motivated by our. Uh, by our hate even, all those different things that motivate us in order to betray. So the person would have trust in us, but because of our anger, because of our hate towards somebody, we will, we may betray somebody and actually do the wrong thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and here the Prophet ﷺ, um, actually tell us, telling us, وَلَا تَخُنْ مَنْ خانك, And don't betray those that betray you. Even if they went that low in their akhlaq, don't go that low. وَلَا يَخْذُلُ they don't, be, they don't betray them. And of course, when we talk about يَخْذُلُ, that would also mean on the other hand, that a Muslim would be just, would be there to support them and would be there to to be honest to give them the the whatever they they need to help them grow in their life and in their akhirah as well so now before i get into that i think it's really important to mention that you could see that the hadith was actually talking about don't oppress, don't betray, etc. In this hadith, on the other hand, you could also read it as, well, there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually asking us to grow in our, in our affection towards the Muslim ummah, in our affection towards the Muslim ummah, to the word, the Muslim brothers and sisters, in where we're actually, if she'afshu salama baynakum, the Prophet sallam actually says, you will not enter Jannah until you love one another. And the Prophet sallam actually gave that tip and said spread salam spread peace amongst you and of course in another hadith the prophet sallam actually says tahadu tahabu give each other gifts and that will develop in um in love amongst you and he also actually said about the tasafah tasafah which really you know shaking hands and and giving hugs and etc and that is part of of bringing in that love and that affection between one another and of course the other part which is one very simple thing giving a smile to your muslim brother or sister is in itself a sadaqa it's a charity that you give doesn't cost much it will make you smile 
and it will make the person in front of you smile because they are reflecting you. Now, in the other part, وَلَا يَحْقِرُ وَلَا يَحْقِرُ That they do not belittle or condescend them. What does condescend or belittle them have to do with any of this? Because when you condescend the person, when you condescend the person, you are, you're, a, you're putting yourself on top of them. In other words, you're only emphasizing on the things that you have and you're seeing yourself with that pride you're seeing yourself as more worthy and that will bring in that pride to see others lower and ya Allah this is this is one of the most things that I hate by the way most things that I hate is when others are belittling because subhanallah you know I and I've seen that more in the educated rich areas than than in um, in, in the rich community and and educated community than actually the simple people and it's so common the simple people they're they're a lot more transparent they're a lot simpler and you know when when you teach yourself and you you learn how to see others based on their, you know, that you, you see them based on their hearts. You don't look at the, the privileges that they have because they didn't get those privileges from their own good. It's a risk from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Intelligence is a risk. Um, wealth is a risk. Beauty is a risk. You didn't actually do it for yourself. So don't necessarily consider yourself that you are somehow more deserving for the risk that you have because you don't really have any power to bring it to yourself. You don't realize how it was given to you. And it could have been given to you as a test. It could have been given to you as a test. And I've seen so many of those, you know, visiting a refugee camps and visiting um, those um, people that are not as privileged and, and, seeing, um, and, and seeing how sincere and and how humble they were is the most beautiful thing that you could see because they deal with you they deal with you with the most beautiful with the most beautiful thing which is their heart they don't deal with you because they think that they're going to get any gain from you um, they deal with you based on their hearts they deal with you with that with that principle and, and that's something you don't necessarily find but unfortunately other people will think that if somebody doesn't have the wealth or somebody doesn't have the beauty or doesn't have the knowledge that they can that they can belittle them and I'd like to say whether you've got the knowledge or the degrees or the money or whatever it is don't condescend to anybody you know there there are many people that don't have the degrees what can actually do and be a lot more transparent and a lot more beautiful than people with high degrees. It's not about the PhDs that you have. And it's not about all the, that money that you have or the house or the children that you have. You never know how that might actually come against you. But it's actually about the inside of you. Because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your outside, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at the inside. All the wealth and all the beauty and all the different privileges that you have, where is it going to be when that person is in the grave? It's all going to be gone. Like it never was. The beauty that you have, it's all going to be gone. Look at those older people. And you will see that they're their complexions, the beauty and everything, it's not even there anymore. It was just a matter of time and it's all gone. The money, all those millions that these people have and all the homes and etc. and all these different things, when they go into the grave, what are they going to be covered with? Just a white place of cloth. Tell me where's the money? Tell me where's the beauty? Where are the cars? Where are the husbands? Where are the children? Where are the where's the wealth? Where are the homes? Where are the degrees? It's all gone. One of the things that I would always advise if you're feeling down or if you're feeling of depression and loss, take a moment and visit the graveyard. 
visit the graveyard. Why? Because when you visit a cemetery, you actually take a moment to just look around, read those dates on those stone tombs, and, and just read those dates, and you'll see, where did those go? For In some of those stones, they would say, Dr. X, or um, father, or mother, etc. And it takes you a moment of realization. What was really worth it? Was it anything in dunya? Nothing. It's the akhirah that you should be concerned about. And some of those graves are 1800s and 1700s. And, and you're walking down, driving down in those graves and reading those those dates on them. And you're wondering, wow, they've been, and some of them are your birth date. And some of them are were born on the same year that you were born in. And you start wondering, I could have been one of those people. And then you start considering and reconsidering was the competition over dunya really that worth it? Or was it the akhirah that was more worth it? Did I really need to go into that sorrow and that sadness all this time for probably the wealth or probably, you know, these different materialistic gains? Was it really worth it? It's the akhirah that's worth it. All this dunya is gone. Where did these people go? They're just, right now, history. Right now, they're just under that earth that you're walking on. You could step over it, and they would not be able to do anything. They, can you hear anything? You can't. And that's the, the scariest sound that you can hear, the silence. Silence, the silence that you hear in a cemetery is a lot scarier than any sound ever. It's the loudest sound that you can hear. The loud sound of silence, with all the oxymoron that there is in that word, it's the reality in where, how can I understand, how can I understand all this that surrounds me, all this that surrounds me, where, where did they go, what was it that they were fighting for, it's all gone. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ actually considered and is telling us here, let that that you really fight for and what you really compete for is really akhirah and not dunya. And at the same time, part of the Muslim Brotherhood is that unsur akhaka zaliman aw mazluman. Even when you want to support your Muslim brother, you want to support them. Remember, support them to go against oppression, to go against, to go against the, 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 the evil path that they might be taking. And which is why the Prophet ﷺ was actually telling us here, pointing it to his heart, taqwa huna, true taqwa is in the heart. It's not about how you appear. It doesn't mean Yes, many will misinterpret it and think, oh, I've got a good heart, I don't have to wear hijab. I've got a good heart, I don't have to pray. I've got a good heart, I don't have to do anything in behavior. No, the Prophet ﷺ and the ayat were saying that those, pe those things actually go with one another. But real taqwa that pushes you to behave in a specific way is actually in the heart. Therefore, when you want to talk to somebody, when you want to judge a Muslim brother or sister, it's always remember, you look at the heart, but that's not something that you necessarily have the power to do. So don't, even when you love somebody, the Prophet ﷺ was saying, Ahbib habibaka hawnan ma. When you love somebody, love them with moderation because they could be your enemy one day. And when you hate somebody, even when you want to hate them, Get, keep that moderation because they could be your best friends one, one day. And he, the Prophet ﷺ goes further and says, and says that, you know, it is enough and an enough evil thing to do when a person would belittle his Muslim brother or sister. Why focus on al-ihtiqar here? Why focus on condescending and belittling others? Because that brings in al-kibr, that brings in that pride 
in pride, the Prophet ﷺ actually says, no one that has an iota of pride in their hearts will enter Jannah. How do I take away pride from my heart? You take away pride from your heart by recognizing the, the things, the faults that you have, by recognizing that it's not about what you gained, but it's about what you have in your heart, which is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge. If you think you've got the money, or you think you've got the privilege, or you've got you think you have any of those, there's so many people before you that had it, and now they're gone. That's number one. Number two, remember if you thought you had the ilm somebody else Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that there are others that are more knowledgeable than you that are actually out there never look at yourself as if you are the center and remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at our hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge our hearts so there could be somebody that is of less education, less degrees, less less um, money, less positions, etc. Simple people that could be racing you in the Jannah. That could be racing you and beating you to Jannah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet actually said right here that belittling and that kibr, that pride, is actually one of the things that no way anybody with the pride in their heart will go to Jannah. The relationship and everything that belongs to somebody else, another Muslim brother, is actually haram on you. In other words, transgressing your limit is totally forbidden, whether that was in his life. When we say damuhu, damuhu, yes, it means blood, but this is actually a metaphor to mean life. In other words, a Muslim's life, a Muslim's wealth, a Muslim's chastity, and a Muslim's reputation, and a Muslim's and a Muslim's family is haram for you to transgress or act in any injustice against them. Because at the end, that would make a major sin. How do I correct myself from doing the major sins? Well, we correct it by starting with the things that motivate those major sins. It is actually envy. It is hatred. It is belittling others. This hadith is teaching us how to not consider ourselves as the center or can get that individualism or that, e that egocentricity and that we have to take it out and we have to live up to the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what makes a good Muslim. And that's what makes a Muslim that is worthy of good at getting Jannah. I'm going to answer some questions here. When we point negative, is it more to prepare the person? Example, he is a great scholar, but um, hardcore, not organized. That way the person already know and will not be shocked or stop taking the class. So here's the, here's the thing. Um, um, the question when we talk about a person, there's a difference between, for example, you might, somebody ask you, you know, should I take classes with Aisha was was you're like, yeah, you can take the classes, but, so here you're not talking as a, as a, as a person like at the same level and trying to belittle, but you're like, you know, but sometimes the classes can be, she can get off topic. Um, and you know and, and get off topic um, too much so um, just to let you know or sometimes her her classes are not always organized and she can get lost in her chain of thoughts and gets you lost so just to let you know and for example is that necessarily considered ghaiba? no it's not considered ghaiba in that sense it's not because you didn't mean to belittle but you meant to let the person know about, for example, the the way the class is held or um, certain things that they should be considering, but it would be different than if you were to belittle the person in, in a way where it is to cause agony and to cause harm. So the person's intention, the person's intention a lot of times does, um, does uh, or in fact, it is actually the main the main motive, the main uh, I would say the main power that that may change the person's 
the person's tone, the words, and that will determine a lot on how that discussion and how that criticism is actually taking place. Um, so I hope I answered that one. Um, is uh, is that role of three days, oh, I mentioned that one, is hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also include not to praise and glorify the destroyed nations like al Faraana and Al-Batra? Um, no, because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually uh, um, when we're talking about praising like uh, nations and and and, and those areas, um, that's actually jahiliya. That's jahiliya, and and praising jahiliya is jahiliya in itself. You wouldn't praise jahiliya unless you had the jahiliya yourself. So um, when we're talking about al farainah for the the pharaohs, for example, um, it's not we're saying that they had a civilization. A magnificent civilization with the pyramids and the science that they had etc it doesn't necessarily mean um, that we're also not acknowledging that they had the kufr that they had um, well they even had incest that was incest and they married their own brothers and sisters etc and that was what the pharaohs actually did in order to maintain their um, their monarchy and maintain their um, maintain what they considered as as the the noble the nobles they considered that they were noble nobles and therefore they didn't want to uh, they didn't want to pollute their blood by bringing in other people so they married their own brothers and sisters and their own mothers so this is this is a jahiliya this is a jahiliya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considered and called it jahiliya and called it kufr. So um, the action itself and all the different things and how they worshipped and etc. So call it by itself. In, and there's a very important book by Muhammad Qutb. And that is one of my favorite books I read when I was in ninth grade. It's called um, La ilaha illallah minhaj uh, or Minhaju Sharia, I think it was called Minhaj Sharia, Haya, and something like that. Um, that book was written by Muhammad Qutb, in where he talks about La ilaha illallah in itself actually being a, 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 a the the main center for civilization, the main center for understanding and defining civilizations and defining what makes prosperity, what makes prosperity, and considers that materialistic prosperity is not necessarily a civilization, but is more of modernity, and that does not necessarily make a civilization. For somebody to be civil would actually mean that they are living based on based on the, the principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person is living based on a, an animal, um, an animal or even lower than the animal, uh, the, lower than the animals in, in their uh, principles, because what motivates animals in in their behavior is really it's either their hunger and wild animals why would they go and attack other animals well it's because their hunger motivates them to do those things um and of course they would attack etc so in other words it's really in there's yes it's their survival they have to survive and they would do that but for a human being for a human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you not to live as animals where it's your um, your survival needs is what determines your principle, but you live to the principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set. So here the pharaohs, for example, they considered their, their survival depended on believing and making others believe that they had... Uh, that they were holy somehow and they were noble people so they considered that that gave them the justification even though the rest of the people did not practice incest but they considered that 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 gave them the justification to practice incest and marry their sisters or brothers or etc because they considered that that they, there was a noble cause for it and, and that of course is jahiliya that's jahiliya so when a person lets their their um, their selfishness lets their uh, their survival and their all those different wild things their hunger their need um, determine uh, determine their their principles that's that's wild that's jahiliya that's jahiliya and that's what um, well that's what the prophets came to um, to fight and that type of jahiliya is what we're asked to hate 
um, what we're asked to um, to hate or even fight against or even or even um, uh, or even work in our amal bil ma'ruf and nahi munkar against whether that meant even today i mean it's given all these different all these different um, narratives in where yes it's about love and it's other one reality it's actually you know a man marrying a man or a woman marrying a woman um, when in reality you know that it's actually going against the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created in this world which is the reproduction and the family system and all that in order in order to make and bring about the stability within the society there's another person saying, SubhanAllah, so true. How do you deal with people who are unjust with you, even if they are family members? That is the hardest thing. That, oh, this needs a sigh. <laughs> this is so true because when we're, there are different levels. The first level, remember when we said Al-Adl and Al-Fadl? I didn't actually, I got, you know, again, it's okay to say that I keep, um, you know, getting off track and, well, what do, what do they call that? There's a term for it when they got off track so much. What do they call it? Forget. Uh, I forget. Uh, I forgot. Okay, I keep forgetting. Um, I, for, I forgot what, what I said. Okay, so when we're talking about family members, there's al-adl. Al-adl is justice. Anywhere I give this much, you give this much. This is al-adl. All right? Justice. It's a balance. But al-fadl is different. Because al-fadl, it's not utopian but al-fadl is more that you're giving based on your principles so you give based on your principles in where somebody might have harmed you but even if they harmed you let's say they took away your iphone let's just assume they took away your iphone and not only did they take it away but they actually broke it too so you go and you decide well you know what i'm gonna actually buy you an iphone but they broke your iPhone. But you were like, yeah, I know. I'm just going to buy them an iPhone. Maybe that'll motivate them to be a better person. This is al-fadl. This is another level. The, the level of al-fadl is, you can call it utopian. You can call it ideal. You can call it um, the highest level of how a person can live in their iman. Um, in where... Even if you may feel that you want this for yourself, but you're actually giving it up, not for the sake of those people, but for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're, you're, you know what justice is, and that's nobility. That is nobility. Al-Fadl is nobility. Yes, I know that I, that person harmed me. I know that my husband harmed me in, 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 in that way, etc. But I'm just going to give in and move on. That is nobility. Not many people are able to live, no, uh, you know, that level. But we just have to say it, and we have to try to get there. I'm not saying, you know, maybe I didn't get there, but at least I'll say it. Hopefully, inshallah, you know, I've seen people that uh, that will actually do that, and and people that, mashallah, I mean, to live up to al-fadl, to live up to that nobility, and not say, well, I did this, therefore they have to do this. Man, this is the akhlaq of al-anbiya, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually praised, actually praised, um, praised um, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he was a wahun halim, that he was halim. What is al-hilm? Al-hilm is really a product of al-fadl. Al-Halim or Al-Hilm is actually a product of Al-Fadl because Al-Fadl or Al-Hilm, sorry, Al-Hilm is when you let go, when you're able and you do have the right to retaliate. But Al-Hilm is when you give in because you want to live up to the principle. You want to be on a level that that person is not on. And that's al-fadl. Like I said, al-hilm is a product of al-fadl. Is a product of an increase in ability of who you would want to be. Um, you're still human. And remember, inna sabru bit tasabbur. You may not be the real patient person, but all our nobility or our, our, our okay, all our akhlaq, here we go, is actually, is it, it actually starts with imitation. So we imitate in the beginning to be reality. I can't handle this. I am losing it. 
I am just in such distress. I really need to be on um, antidepressants, etc. But then you would hold on and you're like, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to get myself busy. I'm going to hang in there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember, will not test you with more than what you can handle. It's all about you. It's a, it's a, it's a muscle of coping. It's a muscle of how do you let yourself cope those moments. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not test you with more than what you can handle. So, إِنَّمَا صَبْرُ sabr is sabr is really, in the beginning, it's, it begins with imitating and believing that you're being patient until you become the patient person. In the beginning, you are imitating to be a person of principle, but then until you become one. In the beginning, we are all those that have those agonies and have those and all those feelings towards others. Why did she get it? Why did he get it? Etc. But then it's about are you gonna be giving al fadl? Are you going to be giving in from your your own self and your own privilege to those that might have the privilege which you might actually envy? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to teach yourself how to tame your feelings and not let your feelings determine your behavior, that's al-fadl. So here is the question, does al-fadl include to keep the door open to the harm to get to us? لا يبنت الناس الله يهديكي I'm sure you didn't mean the question, sister Zainab. Alright, no, do not, in Islam, it is against Islam. It is against Islam to bring harm to yourself. لا ضرر ولا ضرر. And it is against Islam to accept oppression. It is not part of al-fadl to keep the door open to harm. And kind of like what the Bible says, if somebody slaps you on your right side, t turn the left side on to the, for them to slip that left side too. That's the Bible. That's not Islam. In Islam, you are obligated... لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم. That Allah subhanahu wa taala um, dislikes people announcing evil unless you're oppressed. Your duty as a Muslim is to uplift the oppression. It's not part of al-fadl to accept oppression, right? So what is the fine line between al-fadl and al-adl? Al-fadl is when you yourself are giving, in giving in for al-hilm when you're able to retaliate. You're able to retaliate. You're able to harm that person, but you get you live to the nobility and you just give in. All right. But when somebody's oppressing you, no, don't accept oppression and 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 do whatever it takes to the limit to not let that oppression continue on you. And of course, the limit is not of being oppressive. So not because you were and in Islam, not because you were oppressed, it doesn't give you. Um, the right to oppress others and say, well, you know, this person, this person oppressed me in such and such, and therefore I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to teach them a lesson, and then letting your agony, letting your agony and your hatred, um, then determine, determine your behavior. So that that's that's actually that's actually haram. That's actually haram. All right. So the end of our session. Jazakumullah khairan. I know it's actually been an hour and 37 minutes. Mashallah, that was actually long. Uh, here's somebody that says, I heard from a scholar, hate the sin and not the sinner. Then why we punish the sinner and not the sin? What is, what this phrase really means in this hadith? Um, this is not hate the sin and not the sinner is more of a modern, postmodern a uh, postmodern word in where, you know, they always hate the sin and not the sinner, etc. That, that's not really Islam. If it's a scholar that said that, you know, unfortunately right now we're getting a lot of a lot of um, Muslims that are cherry picking from Quran and Sunnah and in, in trying to, I would say, what is the word that I could use? <laughs> trying to... Mm, trying to make Islam seem like it, is, it suits very well and it fits like a mitten in the hand 
um, with postmodernism. Postmodernism comes from a totally different understanding and a totally different philosophy. So um, that that to actually say hate the sinner and not or hate the sin and not the sinner in the end is that um, is that uh, when we're talking about the sin. So how is it that we you know in Islam, for example, whether it's jihad or whether it's avoiding somebody um, or uh, so what do you actually hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you hate the the action and you also hate the sinner you can't really distinguish the uh, the two because the person carries the sin so if with that word hate the sin and not the sinner so should we also punish the sin and not the sinner so what should we do we'll take people's people's crimes and put them in jail and let those criminals walk in and, and roaming in our streets it doesn't go like that it you know the 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 sin is not separated from the sinner all right it actually is part of the person um it's part of the person that sin would not have been would not have been committed unless that sinner decided to do that sin so to um separate those two is really a postmodern a postmodern um influence in where in where you know they're always trying to distinguish yeah people you know that's it's going to do two different things and where um yeah the person is different from from the action no the action is carried out by the person himself the action is carried by the person himself and you can't distinguish the boat you, you can't distinguish both and in the end um but at the same time it doesn't mean that if a person commits a sin that you would necessarily uh, consider that these people are doomed because even when that man even when that man and that woman that man and that woman from uh, f that, that committed the zina the Prophet ﷺ, when they had um, stoned them the Prophet ﷺ, and one of them got a little bit of blood uh, shattered on them and he started saying that he started cursing them and the Prophet ﷺ actually said, you know, the 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 repentance that they had done, even if it were distributed on all the people in Medina, it would have been enough, like a fetons, like it would have been enough to to give them that pass to enter Jannah. Um to the pass to enter Jannah. And that's the thing, is that there's a difference even when somebody is a sinner when somebody is a sinner, you want to keep in mind that you yourself, there could be sins that, um, that that's why we make the dua. Or whatever we had, um, whatever we had forgotten or whatever we had committed by mistake. Um, and... And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that see their, their the, the, the sins and make us from those that avoid sins and make us from those that love the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make us from those that are rashidin and make us from those that have their hearts better than their outside and make us from those that keep keep the agony and keep the hatred towards Islam or towards Muslims, sorry, towards Muslims away from them. And may we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our our hearts filled with light and our eyes filled with light and make us light and and make us from those that spread light. And keep the fitna away from us and our children. Amin ya Rabbi Allah yahfadku jami'an and jazakumullah khairan everyone. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That was a long, an hour and 42 minutes. Sorry, everyone.